Hello, dear friends, and welcome to our weekly program on Kardec Radio on Sunday evenings, where we nourish our souls 24-7, all year long and every year. There is thousands of podcasts to choose from and lots of live programs. And we gather here on Kardec Radio to talk about the last part of Genesis. The chapter that we are studying right now is called The Theory of Foreknowledge, which is chapter 16. And last week, we discussed items 1 through 8. Today, we will be continuing on chapter 16 with chapter 16 and study it all the way through item 18. But before we continue, and since we kind of breaking up this chapter, we want to share the screen and recap what we learned last week before we continue with our study. So let us do this right now. And then we're gonna double check and see that technology is cooperative. So now let us quickly check and see here on the phone. Everything is working. Yay, it looks good. Wonderful friends. So here we go, chapter 16, the foreknowledge of the future. It's something that we're all curious about, right? And we kind of learned a little bit about what it takes to foretell the future and how the mechanism works. Um, so what we learned last week is that a dematerialized, more purified spirit is like a man on the mountain. The example that Alan Kardec explained and showed to us, the picture he painted, was a man standing on top of a high mountain, looking down into the valley and being able to see the whole entire stretch. And for that person, everything is happening at once because this man has the vision, a very broad vision. Now, this man descends the mountain, is down in the valley, and all of a sudden, this man only sees just about the next step for him or her, for him. So at this moment, the concept of time appears that one thing happens after the other. So the man on the mountain may see the mountain line all the way at the end of the valley, whereas the man who is down in the valley might only encounter this mountain line two years later. So that is kind of like the picture that Alan Kardec drew for us to help us understand how um, the statement that he later makes is that there is really no time but that all events are happening at the same moment. So now let us put this picture of this dematerial of this man on the mountain aside. That's just an analogy. And we go back here to what he tells us, and that is dematerialized spirits, spirits that are not attached to matter, that are more purified. They are like the man on the mountain. They have a broader view than you and I. Space and length of time do not exist for them. Events do not unroll sequentially. The beginning and the end of events, of what they see, is all is happening all at once. So that's what happens with God. There is no, oh, down the road in 10 years, X, Y, and Z is going to happen from that perspective because it's already happened. It's already happening. It's hard for us to comprehend. But I think Alan Kardec was very smart. Um, creating this picture for us of this man on the mountain, high up on this perch, because that we can imagine. So the extent and the penetration of these dematerialized spirits or of any spirit um, is proportional to their purification. The more pure spirit is, the lighter their, their perispirit, the more dematerialized the spirit is, the broader their vision. Makes sense, right? So then we also learned that while these spirits on high 
might see a lot. However, the foreknowledge of the future might be harmful to us. So that's why by design, we are not capable while we're here on earth to see the future in general terms. Most of us don't. And um, now we know why. Because the foreknowledge of the future might be harmful to us. It might impinge on our free will or cause us to paralyze. And if we imagine, if I knew that um, in six days, my dog is going to run away, I wouldn't leave my house anymore. <laughs> Just a simple example. So we can imagine that it would alter our lives, right? If we knew what would be happening. Or if we knew we'd be winning a million dollars in a year, would we be working right now? No, maybe not. We will be sitting on the couch if we're not very aware of what the consequences for this lifestyle is. We might just be lounging around waiting for the million dollars to roll into the door, right? So that's why we're kind of getting the idea. It would not be conducive to us to be foretold what, what, what's going to happen. However, the corner of the veil does get lifted in special cases. Um, and that is when it is for a useful purpose. For example, imminent danger or great calamities that may be foretold, revolutions, sometimes even in persecuted sects, um, the, lay, the veil may be lifted. So in other words, the veil won't be lifted only for curiosity purposes. So that is pretty clear. So what we also heard is that the gift of prediction is not supernatural. Because if we go back to our example of the man on the mountain, that's nothing supernatural. And so if a spirit is purified of God, of course they have the wide, uh, the wide view. It may appear supernatural to someone like you and I, because we don't have that capacity, but it is not. It's part of the law of nature. Uh, the gift rests upon the properties of the soul. The more dematerialized, the less attached to matter, the more purified the peri spirit the spirit is, the more these properties are developed. So inherent to the state of spiritualization or dematerialization of the spirit is that gift. The perception is not determined by distance, but by penetration. So it doesn't matter where the spirit is. It is how deeply it can penetrate the situation. So now let us switch over to item nine. It says item eight up here on our slide, but we're now switching over to item nine. And if you like to follow along on, in Genesis in the book, it is on page 372, item nine. And this is what we pick up today. So this is the summary from last a week, which will help us to understand this, this uh, week's study. So here, Alan Carter is saying, furthermore, one must understand that this perception, na namely the perceptive, perceptive qualities of a soul, is not limited to distance, but that it entails being able to penetrate everything. And that can only be done the more purified the spirit is. We will repeat, it is a faculty inherent. It is a faculty inherent and proportional to the spirit's state of dematerialization. So it's inherent to the spirit. This faculty is weakened by incarnation. However, it is not annulled completely, for the soul is not enclosed within the body as in a box. So we know that sometimes we do get, uh, we see a little bit more on certain days when we tune in more, right? But generally speaking, this faculty, which is inherent to our soul, is weakened during incarnation, but not completely annulled. The incarnate spirit possesses it, although always to a lesser degree than when it is completely free. Makes sense. The flesh kind of puts a veil over us, over our perceptive organs. This is what gives certain individuals a power of penetration that others lack 
completely, giving them a more acute moral vision and an easier understanding of extra material matters. So even while we incarnated, and even though these faculties of um, perceptive perceptivity are dimmed while we're in the flesh, there is different grades among us incarnates. Some of us have more of a faculty than others. And it is linked to the state of purification that we are in. Now, part of it is depending on where we find ourselves in our overall timeline of incarnations, how um, evolved we are. And the other thing is, of course, also our lifestyle, right? Are we tuning in? What are we eating? Where are we dwelling with our thoughts and emotions? Is a whole big path package deal are we working on our inner transformation which is the key for that the incarnate spirit not only perceives but also remembers what it has seen in the spirit state and this remembrance is like a picture drawn in its mind so we have some latent memories some perception during incarnation it can see but only vaguely as if through a veil in the state of freedom, it sees clearly. The state of freedom is discarnation. The principle of sight is not outside the spirit, but within the spirit, which is why it does not need our external light source. So it's a quality. It's not linked to any outside organs. It's not linked to any organs. The peri spirit sees not limited on one spot. It's an overall seeing. We talked about that in um, Genesis earlier on when we studied the miracles, that the perispirit doesn't have an organ of vision like our physical body does. Our physical body needs light and it comes strictly through these two eyes that it can see. However, the spirit's vision is much more distributed. And it lies, of course, within the spirit, not outside, right? So this, uh, for a spirit to see, the light doesn't have to be switched on, in other words. Through moral development, its psych circle of ideas and concepts broadens, see? So it's inherent, it's in, within, built in. And part of it is based on knowledge, of on education, and not just um, information per se, but moral education as well. Through moral development, its circle of ideas and concepts broadens. Through gradual dematerialization of the peri spirit, it purifies itself from the coarse elements that altered the refinement of its perception, from which it is easy to understand that the extension of a spirit's faculties follows its progress. So bottom line, and we said it several times with so many words already today, but we'll say it one more time. The capacity to foretell the future, to see more than you and I are seeing, or let me speak for myself, than I am seeing, because I don't know how much you guys are seeing, is dependent on the quality of our soul, on the moral development of our soul, on the, on the um, level of inner transformation we've done through our many incarnations and in that the more evolved we are the more dematerialized we are the less we are attached to matter the less coarse our perispirit is the more we will be able to see both as discarnates as well as incarnates however being an incarnate we generally speaking see less because it's like a veil is over our vision, our, our per percep perception. As a spirit, we do not have organs to see like we do right now, and we don't need light. All right? So now. So a spirit compared with an incarnate spirit, as a discarnate spirit compared with an incarnate spirit is like a sighted person, somebody who can see compared with a blind person, right? So we, we can really imagine how that looks like. So 
principle of sight lies within the spirit. The faculty of foreseeing the future is vague as if through a veil in incarnate spirits. It is more clearly developed in discarnate spirits, right? So the summary of the perception, the theory of, of foreknowledge, I mean, let's say, the summary of the capacity to perceive the future is dependent on our moral development, the ideas and concepts that broaden our vision, and our the state of dematerialization of our perisphere. So now, item 10. It is the degree of the extension of the spirit's faculties that during incarnation renders it more able or less so understand to understand spiritual matters. So we know why, right? This aptitude, however, is not the necessary consequence of the development of intelligence, right? So it's not dependent on intelligence necessarily that a spirit has the aptitude to foresee the future. Ordinary knowledge does not confer it, which is why we see persons of great knowledge who are as blind to spiritual matters as others are to material ones. Makes sense, right? There is highly intelligent people walking the earth, and we wonder there's no there's no spiritual um, capacity in these people. We are not saying that with judgment, just as an observation. Now we know because knowledge per se does not determine that. The former are resistant to spiritual matters because they do not understand them due to the fact that their progress has not yet been completed in that sense. They just haven't reached that point yet. Whereas persons of ordinary education and intelligence may be seen to grasp them more easily, showing that they possess a preformed intuition of such matters. So it does not depend necessarily on the degree of educational knowledge for someone to have the faculty of, to see the future, to have second sight. However, what it does depend on for sure is the state of moral development. And that's why we find Alan Craddock says under little educated people often or less educated people with less intelligence, much more of an inherent capacity to grasp these concepts. For them, it is a red, so for those who are less educated and have this greater capacity to see, for them, it is a retrospective memory of what they have seen and known, whether in the errant state or during previous lifetimes. So it's a memory that they have. Just as some persons have an intuition about the languages and sciences that they knew previously. Right? There's some, some spirits that are born and they just, as they grow up, they learn one language after the other and one wonders, how can they do that? How do they manage? Well, it is most likely based on a foreknowl of a knowledge from previous lifetimes where they spoke those languages and have studied them. And the same is the case with second side with the percep perceptivity, perception. So ordinary knowledge does not confer aptitude of spirit side. Persons of ordinary education and intelligence may grasp the faculty much more easily. It's based on intuition, their memory of the errant state or previous lifetimes. So that was item 10. Let me check. Does anyone have a question so far? I'm just seeing my little green light. I'm feeling detached from you, my dear friends. So I just want to see whether I can quickly connect with you. I'm feeling detached Ooh. from you, my dear friends. Okay, here we are. Great. Um, there's Shane Martin, Mark Carlos. Okay, dear friends, thank you so much for joining. And no questions yet. So item 11. As for the future of spiritism, now Alan Kardec deviates a little bit into spiritism. Now, let us keep in mind, item 11 is really about 160, 170, 180 years ago. And it's that perspective. It's not today's 
perspective, right? As for the future of spiritism, we know that the spirits are unanimous in affirming that its triumph is close at hand in spite of the obstacles put up against it. So he's very optimistic. Such foreknowledge is easy for them. First of all, because its spread is their personal work. But directly taking part in the movement or by guiding it, they consequently know what they must do. So the spirits who are saying during the time of Alan Kardec that spiritism will be successful, it's part of their work. They have a very clear, good handle on the situation, he says. Second, it is not enough for them to consider a period of short duration. And in this period, they can see the powerful helpers that God furnishes and who will not be long in manifesting. So he's, he's really showing us who can trust the um, foreknowledge that spiritism will be successful. Again, this is hundreds of years ago. Without having to be discarnate spirits, let spiritists look no more than 30 years ahead in the midst of the generation that is emerging from back that perspective. From there, let them consider what is occurring nowadays. Let them follow spiritism's progress march, progressive march, and they will see those who believe they are called to reverse it consumed in a vain effort. They will see them disappear from the scene little by little in light of the tree that is growing big and tall. So in other words, all those who are trying to throw stones into the path of spiritism will not succeed, cause some vain efforts. But this tree will grow strongly and we can attest to that, right? I mean, let's look at, at Brazil in particular, but even in the rest of the world, even the movement here in the United States has grown tremendously in the last 20 years, even in the last 10 years. So yes, it is growing. Now let us move on to item 12. We're now finding ourselves on page 374. The ordinary incidents of private life are most often the result of the way that each person acts. So obviously, right, our incidents that we incur of our private life are based on the law of cause and effect. We, it's the result of our thoughts, feelings, actions, words, and so forth from the past. And every minute now in the now will determine our future because everything plants a seed, right? So that makes total sense. Now, when something is in... Um, Sorry, we got derailed. Some people will succeed according to their capacity, skill, perseverance, prudence, and energy, while others will fail because of their inaptitude. Thus, one can say that each of us is the artisan of his or her own future, a future that is never subject to blind fatalism, independent of the individual, because the only true fatalistic aspect of our lives, according to the Spirits on High in the Spirits book, Alan Kardec asks one of these questions, is our day of discarnation. Everything else, we have a say in it. While there are some physical um, aspects, let's say accidents or illnesses, that we may have code predetermined, but sometimes we would also get assigned to us, depending on how evolved we are, and then those we can't avoid, however, our response to it can always be altered, right? I mean, we can resist it and that would not help, but we can also embrace it and work with it and maybe transcend it much faster. That's when our free will comes in again. So in other words, it is we are the artisans of our future. By knowing an individual's character, one can easily predict the fate that awaits him or her on the path he or she has taken. Well, maybe we won't be able to do that so well, but I'm sure there's some people who can and also spirits, of course. Now, this stands in contrast to humankind. So this was how our life on a personal level gets determined, right? By law of cause and effect. We are the outer artisans of our own future. The events that touch upon the overall interests of humankind, overall humankind, are governed by providence, so by God. So that's interesting, right? 
the overall interests of humankind are governed by providence. When something is in God's designs, it must be accomplished one way or another. Men and women contribute to its execution, because we're free will, right? But no one is indispensable. So the overall interests of humankind are governed by providence. But we have a say. So we can help or we can make matters worse. We can push up against progress, right? Men and women contribute to its execution, but no one is indispensable. So if we think, oh my God, this and this is not going to work without me, hmm, we may want to rethink that concept because that may be vanity, right? Selfishness, that might be pride. No, we're all replaceable any second. So this is really important. It keeps us humble, right? We're all indispensable. Otherwise, God would be at the mercy of God's creatures. And that makes sense too, right? If I don't do my share in X, Y, and Z project, I'm, a, I'm participating in X, Y, and Z project, which God set there for us to accomplish as mankind, and I'm not doing my share and I can't be replaced, God is at my mercy, right? Mine and everyone else's mercy. That wouldn't be, right? God is God and can't be at the mercy of you and I. So it makes absolute sense that we are indispensable. If those entrusted with a mission fail to fulfill it, someone else will be assigned to it. It's good to know, right? No mission is unavoidable. No mission is unavoidable. Individuals are always free to fulfill that which has been entrusted to them. We're always free to fulfill what has been entrusted to us and which they have voluntarily accepted because how many times have we accepted even the vicissitudes of our lives, the hard spots, the, the, the suffering, and we're not in touch anymore. But let us trust that we have accepted it on some level because it's the best for us, for our soul growth. If they do not fulfill, so if the humans do not fulfill these assignments, these missions, they lose the benefit and assume the responsibility for the delays that might result from their negligence or ill will. So if we don't go with the program and we don't fulfill our mission, we have free will not to do, obviously. There is no fatalism in that. We are indispensable, we can be replaced, but we also will have to live with the loss of the opportunity. And we will assume the responsibility for the delays and we will, will have missed out on the benefits that we may have received as a result. So this is really important for us. This is really important information for us to be aware, to make sure that we're not um, omitting missions that are part of our lives, to make sure we're not cutting corners because of our selfishness, our pride, our laziness, whatever the reason may be. We're best to be really in tune with the missions of our lives because we don't want to accrue more debt, right? Ideally, we want to reduce the debt we have in this lifetime. If they become an obstacle to the mission's fulfillment, God can snap them with one breath. Whew, that sounds scary, right? God snapping us with one breath. Wow. So let us go to, um, for a second, let us deviate to the Spirit's book. Let's see whether we have it here. Uh, question 781. Brilliant, because Alan Kardec asked, is humankind ever permitted to halt the march of progress? And I think we know the answer already. The answer is no. But human can't, can't, humankind can sometimes slow it down. What are we to think of those who attempt to halt the march of progress? They are poor, conceited beings whom God will chastise, and they will be swept away by the torrent they meant to stop. 
So in other words, progress is a condition of human nature. It is a living force. Um, divine justice desires the good for all. So we cannot push up against progress. In question 782, he makes it very clear. The spirits on high make it very clear. When Alan Kardec asks, aren't there those who obstruct progress out of good faith? Believing they're helping it because from their own point of view, they often see progress where it does not in fact exist. It's very interesting, right? When we look at our current um maybe world situation but let's just narrow it down to the united states those people who support one side and think that they are aligned with progress um and they're looking to the others and saying uh what are you guys doing you know you are just not going with the program and then the other side looks at this side and says oh my gosh you know what are they doing you know they're holding up this whole they're they're not cooperating, you know, they're this, that, and the other. So it's it's important for us to keep in mind to be humble because who knows whether we're really aligned with progress, right? We may think we are, but we may not be. So here he says now, so what happens if we think we are aligned, right? Um, and we don't think we're, we're obstructing progress because we're operating out of good faith. Well, there the answer is, they are like a tiny pebble under the wheel of a large cart. A tiny pebble cannot keep a large cart from moving. So at least we can rest assured we won't be derailing the whole planet or the world or the United States. But as we heard here in Genesis, um, we can miss an opportunity if we are misaligned, right? So anyway, let us move on uh, to question 975. Because there, um, the spirits help us to realize and be aware of the consequences if we are either consciously or unconsciously obstructing, trying to obstruct progress, not doing our share, to, so to speak. And there, um, the question is, do low order spirits comprehend the happiness of the, happiness of the morally upright? So this question seems to be unrelated, but in the answer, we learn that there's three different ways of how we, um, so to speak, make ourselves, um, we create con negative consequences for us. And one is that we suffer for all the wrong we have done, which we intentionally caused. We will suffer the consequences of all the wrong we've intentionally caused. Number two, we will suffer the wrong for all the good that it might, that we might, that m might have been done, but didn't get done because of us not fulfilling our mission, omitting duties and the like. So we're not only liable for what we haven't done, but also for all the good that didn't happen as a result of not fulfilling, let's say, our mission. And thirdly, we are responsible for all the harm that resulted from the good we failed to do. So there's a three level uh, consequence that we will experience that now that we know it, we may want to be very conscious of always doing our very best and fulfilling our duty and seeing that our will is aligned with God's will and that we're fulfilling our reincarnatory plan. Are we in touch with it? Are we tuning in? Are we making sure? Or are we thinking we are in charge and know everything better, right? So this is this is a tall order, but it's a good reminder. So thank you for this beautiful reminder. All right, so let us continue. Um, where were we? So the incidents of private life are a result of how people act, law of cause and effect. The overall interests of humankind are governed by providence. Men and women add to their execution. We do our share. Nobody is indispensable, though. No mission is unavoidable. If folks don't fulfill their mission, if we don't fulfill our mission, we lose the benefit and we assume the responsibility for the delay. Okay. 
wait a second here. Okay. Um, let's see, where are we? 14. Thus, the final result of an event may be certain because it lies within God's designs. So things are in God's hands. And let us remember that in these, these days as well. Everything is in God's hands. So let us have faith. We do our share, but we also practice faith. Right? We don't become depressed or anxious. However, since the details and method of execution are most frequently dependent on the circumstances and human free will, the ways and means may be contingent. Yes, we have free will. So how we're getting from A to B, A to Z, and how quickly depends on how we exercise our free will. And then consequently is dependent on the circumstances. Right? We're co-creators with God. We're co-creators. Spirits can give us a sense of the whole if it is useful for us to be forewarned. But in order to foresee the actual place and date, they would have to know beforehand the decision that such and such individual will make. So now, as we have detoured a little bit around our responsibility and our share in the whole, based on our free will, our moral education, and our knowledge, we are reminded of Emmanuel in Thought and Life, clearly educating us, teaching us, showing us that there's two wings needed for the ascent to God. One is the one of knowledge, but that includes also moral knowledge. And the other one is the application of it. It's love. It's, it's love. It's service. It's charity. So we need both. So spirits can give us a sense of the whole. They can give us a foresight if it is useful for us but they will not be able to give us the exact timing of different events and occurrences. Time and space cannot be determined except with the help of points of comparison or reference. This will be the next item. So spirits give us own, can give us an overview. If it is providential, if it is helpful, not for curiosity reasons and not so that we will be um, our free will will be impinged on. No, but they won't really give us exact timing. So now let's see why. If this decision is not yet in that individual's mind, so one reason is why they can't give us an exact timing is because the decision or the event is not yet in that individual's mind. Then whatever it turns out to be may speed up or delay the accomplishment of the event or modify the secondary means of carrying it out, although everything will still lead on the, to the same result. So if somebody wants to give us a reading about our future and we haven't really um, made the decisions yet, so it's not clear in our minds, then there is one reason why they wouldn't be able to actually tell us because there's so many variables. Right? May, we may speed up or delay the accomplishment of the event. We may be modifying it. There might be secondary means to carry it out. And even though we will end up at Z, it's not clear when that's going to happen. Right? Does that make sense? I think it makes sense. Thus, it is, for example, that by means of the whole of the circumstances, spirits can foresee that an unavoidable war is close at hand or not, but without being able to foresee the exact day on which it will begin or the detailed incidents that may be modified by human will. Makes sense, right? So the spirits may not, may know that a war is going to break out, but they may not be able to tell for those reasons, because there's so many aspects that um, have an impact on the timeline. They cannot tell us exactly what the timing will be and what the exact incident will be that will lead to this war. We've had in the last six months, 
a lot of people who made predictions about the election and about other things. And also a lot of people talked about different timelines. It kind of explains why it is hard to tell, oh yeah, this and this person is going to win or this and this is going to happen before or after the election. For example, there's many different reasons. So we need to be a little bit careful when there is someone who is just, oh yeah, this is going to happen on this day and this and that and the other. It may not be coming from a higher source for multiple reasons, because A, it may take away our free will, uh, B, it may not come true, because how can they tell exactly, right? Because now we understand how many different energies may impact the timeline. And then there is, you know, incarnates who made predictions saying, yeah, there's multiple time timelines and it can take whatever it is between six months and five years depending on the overall picture of, of, you know, what we as individuals, how we contribute to the whole also, right? So it really helps us to understand even current predictions, right? The word timeline and, and, and also a lot of sources have recently said, well, it's all been taken care of. It's all already happened. Now we understand why. For us, it hasn't happened, of course, because we're operating on linear time. But, you know, remember that person who's on the, on the hill, the higher spirits, they see it all at once. And from that perspective, it all has already happened. It's already there, right? So, okay, let us go back. Um, Fifteen. In order to determine the time of future events, it will also be necessary to take into account a characteristic inherent to the very nature of spirits. So here's another reason. And this reason is characteristic to the nature of spirits. Time, and this is talking now about time, allowing us to kind of snap a little bit out of our sense of time. Time like space cannot be determined except with the help of points of comparison or reference that divide it into measurable periods. So this is a little bit hard to get because we're so attached to all oh, the clock is ticking, tick, 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 tick. We're so attached to all, oh, this is how long an hour is, five minutes, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and there is spring and there's fall and there's summer and there is the months, right? There's so many ways we're, we're indoctrinated to think in terms of linear time. But actually we're hearing that time like space can actually not be determined. The only way it can be determined is when we have points of reference, comparisons. And these comparisons divided into measurable periods. So on Earth, the natural division of time into days and years is marked out according to the rising and setting of the sun. The point of reference is, okay, now it's dark, sun set. Then the sun comes back up and it's at different times. And there we saw so a point of reference. We're calculating then out of that the hours, the days, right? the months, the seasons. So that's the point of reference here is the setting and rising sun. And how long it takes for the earth to travel around the sun. The units of time measurement necessarily vary on different worlds. So this is where it also becomes more complicated. We have our sense of time and measurement of time and our points of reference. But other planets, it looks very different. The units of time measurement vary on different worlds since their astronomical periods are different. So consequently, on Jupiter, for example, the days are equivalent to 10 of our hours. So instead of 24 hours, it's only 10 hours as an equivalent to hours, one day on Jupiter. And the years are almost 12 Earth years. <gasps> How strange, right? So there is, on the one hand, the days seem to be shorter from our perspective, but the years are a lot longer. And then our mind can't even calculate, how, how is that possible, right? But now let's assume 
a spirit, right? What is their sense of timing? And now they're going to predict based on what? Thus, for each world, there's a different way for measuring time according to the nature of the sidereal evolutions involved which is why spirits who are not familiar with our world would have difficulty in determining our dates. Of course, right? When they're from a higher, from a different planet, you know, yeah, maybe they're so, so they're like Jesus and they just know they're very, very evolved, but maybe not. However, apart from worlds per se, there are no such means for determining time. So there is the different time frames from different worlds on the one hand, but on the other hand, for spirit, um, however, apart from these worlds, there are no such means for determining time when you're in the spirit world. For spirit in space, there's neither a sunrise nor a sunset to make the days, nor periodic revolutions to mark the years. For such a spirit, there's only the duration of infinite space. Ha! Huh. So now we can understand how difficult it is, even from that perspective, to predict clearly when something is going to happen and for what purpose, what will be the exact incident. But the general overview, that's possible. When? Beneficial. Moreover, a spirit who had never incarnated on any world at all would have no idea about fractions of time measurement. When a spirit who is foreign to the earth comes to it to manifest itself, it cannot assign dates to even events unless it identifies with our usages. So that helps, right? Now let's go on to item 16. Spirits who comprise the invisible population of our globe where they have already lived and where they continue to live in our midst, naturally identify with our habits. So spirits who live, who have lived on earth and closer to earth are identified and have knowledge of how the earth works. So they have an easier time. They can very easily set dates for future events when they know them. But it's not always permitted for them to release them. Uh, because it's dependent on the circumstances and dependent on the free will. And it's contingent on the human decision making. A precise date does not actually exist except after the event is carried out. So it is very relative. There's many considerations that go into predicting any events, predicting the future, for our future. That is why circumstantial predictions cannot offer any certainty and should be accepted only as probabilities. So if we go to a fortune teller or if we go to a psychic, let's keep that in mind. They won't be really able to do it. And if we insist, we may attract um, misinformation. So only probabilities. Truly knowledgeable spirits never make predictions for set times. So let us keep that in mind. Truly knowledgeable spirits never make predictions for set times. To insist on obtaining precise details is to expose ourselves to deception by frivolous spirits who, without any regard for the truth, will tell anything and everything. Right? They're ruthless. They're, they're, not, as a, they're not necessarily ruthless, but they could be. They're, they're frivolous, maybe. They're, they're just not as evolved yet. They're more ignorant, and they will just go ahead and say something. The manner generally employed to date with regards to predictions makes them true. This mysterious and cabalistic form of which Nostradamus provides the most complete example gives them a certain prestige in the eyes of the common folk. So Nostradamus, for example, um, foresaw the future, but it was in a Kabbalistic form. So it was encoded in a way. Because of their ambiguity, ambiguity, they lend themselves to many different interpretations. And that's kind of like curious, right? So the predictions from by Nostradamus and during those, those eras, they were so encoded that 
they could be interpreted in many different ways and be true today. So that according to the meaning attributed to certain allegories or conventional words, or according to the way certain bizarrely complicated calculations were made, together with a little goodwill one can find shortly afterwards, almost anything one wants. So it opened up, the predictions were made in a way that they could be twisted this way or that way, or interpreted this way or that way. Today, however, the circumstances are no longer the same. So today it's different. How is it today with the predictions? The positivism of the present century hardly accommodates Sibylline language. So what is he saying here? So what, is, what does he mean by the positivism of the present century? Now that was the 20th century, right? So positivism is a philosophical theory, theory genuine theory of genuine knowledge that's exclusive, that exclus exclusively comes from the experience of natural phenomena. Only sensory experience interpreted through reason is the source of knowledge. So that's basically science, right? So that's the positivism that he refers to. So again, the positivism of the present century, which is during Alan Craddock's times, hardly accommodates Sibylline, which means prophetic language. Because it's so scientific, right? Everything is natural phenomena. I have to be proven and, and sourced and, and so forth. Sensory experience, right? It's more materialistic. Um, the spirits speak the language today, the spirits speak the language of everyone else, just as they would have while alive, since they have not ceased to belong to humankind. So today we don't have the Kabbalistic form of speech and expression anymore. Today, the, the um, fore foreknowledge, the foretelling of the future is done. Spirits speak like you and I. It's st more straightforward. Um, they warn us, the spirits warn us about future personal or general matters whenever it might be useful and to the degree of discernment with which they are endowed. Thus, their predictions today are more like warnings that take nothing from our free will. So in contrast to back then, Nostradamus, today the spirits speak like you and I, and it is more like a warning and it does not take away anything from our free will. Very respectful. That's why they would not tell us, don't do this and do this necessarily at all. And at this time and in this date and there and this, this exactly is going to happen because that would all have an impact on our free will. Moreover, their opinion is nearly always properly explained because they do not want people to use blind faith to disregard their reason, which enables them to evaluate their soundness. And that's another thing, Spiritism is so helpful, helping us and reminding us always to uh, look at the spirit messages and interpret them and, and analyze them to see um, that we can assess their validity better. Contemporary item 18. Contemporary humankind also has its prophets. So today we have prophets too. Um, more than one writer, poet, literary person, historian, historian or philosopher has sensed in his or her writings the future march of things. Frequently it is also the result of special unconscious clairvoyance or an inspiration coming from the outside that messages of the future are being transmitted. So dear friends, we have foreknowledge today. We've learned that spirit, really knowledgeable spirit, spirits from on high will never give us clear guidance, do or don't do this, or tell us time and date of events. A, because the, the um, theory of time, uh, the experience of time, the measurement of time is different on different planets. 
and of course does not even really exist in the spirit world for spirits but they also never want to fulfill any curiosity and they will never impinge on our infringe on our free will so it is more of a warning that they may utter but always respectful of our free will so let us keep all of this in mind and um we also learned that we are we carry a lot of responsibility we determine our future life and we call co collaborate in the greater picture of humanity and if we do not fulfill our missions, then we incur debt. We do not only omit opportunities, but we also incur debt. We can't, we are indispensable. We, anyone, we can be replaced anytime. And, um, and let us keep in mind that the timelines are all already happen. The perspective from on high, only we operate on this linear time and have the future and the past as a result. Okay, dear friends, um, let us stop sharing and let us connect with you to say goodbye. Hi, so let's see who is here. Um, there's Mark, thank you again for joining, dear friend. Flavia, Nora, dear friend, thank you so much for joining. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to post them. Next week, we're going to continue with chapter, whoops, I just closed it. We will be continuing now with chapter 17, and that's predictions in the gospel. So we've set the stage to understand the theory of foreknowledge, and now we can understand a little bit better of what happened in the, for the future, the predictions of the gospel. So thank you so much for joining, dear friends. Big hug, and thank you, dear spirit mentors and Jesus and God, for allowing us to be here, to have this beautiful platform of Cardiac Radio, nourishing our souls always so we can come together and enhance our knowledge and use the knowledge to uh, improve our moral development, our inner transformation. Thank you all and God bless you. <laughs>